My name is Dave Neff. I'm co-chair of this event with my colleague John Blackstock for our Parsons College Wall of Honor. So welcome to the fifth annual Parsons College Wall of Honor dedication ceremony. We're honored to have such a great turnout for this event to recognize members of our student body who have gone into their chosen profession and have made a mark not only on Fairfield, but the state of Iowa, on our country, and on the world. What I would like to do at this time is introduce our Mayor, Ed Malloy, and he will give you a mayoral welcome to Fairfield. Mayor Malloy. Good morning, everyone. School spirit is enlivened, and I think the general is fine. We'll definitely <laughs> Well, welcome back to your home. Welcome back to Fairfield. We're very honored and very proud to have you here. You know, I was just talking with Bob Tree about what, uh, how, how prepared our community is for this event because over the last two weeks, on the front page of our Fairfield Ledger, we've been reading about our uh, inductees and board recipients and the incredible lives that, uh, that they've led and what they've accomplished. Uh, we all get to share in that pride and I realize that if Parsons College were still alive, this ceremony would probably be taking place somewhere on campus and wouldn't have the notice of the public and of the whole community. So it is really our extraordinary uh, good opportunity to share in this event with you and the whole community welcomes you and is really prepared for this. So congratulations to all of the inductees for uh, this, today's ceremony. And sharing the Parsons legacy here in this uh, iconic building, this really center of our community at this point in time, with hundreds of events that come through here, thousands and thousands of people from outside our community come to different events here, whether it's a quilt show or a Jim and Rock Mineral show or whether it's an Elvis impersonator on stage. Uh, we seem to get it all here. And they get a chance to review the tremendous legacy that Parsons had uh, on our city, and that will forever be a part of our community. <coughs> you know, earlier this year, in, in fact, it was in January, we received a phone call from a woman who was a writer for Smithsonian Magazine, which is a monthly that comes out of the Smithsonian Institution. And last year, they had done an issue dedicated to the 12 or 10 best places in America to visit. Now, I don't know which cities were in that issue, uh, but they were not governed by population. So this year, what they decided to do was follow that up with an issue where they featured the top 10 best cities in America to visit below 15,000 population. So we received a call in January and said that through their research, we had made the top 20 and that she was going to come and visit to determine who would be in the top 10. So we had her here on the last week of January. Not our best. <laughs> it was cold, it was foggy, the fog was freezing on the roads, we couldn't hardly get around, but she saw enough. And she really got a sense of how extraordinary Fairfield uh, has become over the last couple of decades with the advent of so much of the culture and the arts that have been expressed, uh, the university, uh, some of the sustainability elements like uh, e Abundance Eco Village just north of the city where there are 20 homes that are off the grid. So many things that you just wouldn't find anywhere and have their own ability to attract tourism that we made the top 10. We were number seven uh, in America among cities to visit. great things happen in this community because we have people who own their passions and so many things get done. And, and I at this time want to uh, recognize a, a man whose singular passion for his alma mater, Parsons College, uh, has created this and has made this uh, an indelible and important part of our community and that is Dave Neff. Partners in this effort, but for Dave, 
in our community. He is Mr. Parsons. Uh, he's been on our Chamber Ambassadors uh, group, and they wear red jackets, but when they wear green, you know what's going on. <laughs> so Dave, thank you for that, and welcome everyone. Please have a wonderful weekend here. Uh, be happy, I've um, just been invited to lunch, so I'll be happy to join you today. If you have any other uh, individual questions, be happy to answer them at that time. Thank you very much. Many times when we look back and think, where have we been over the years, we need to look forward. And today, uh, those of you who received the e-newsletter are aware, this is our first live stream over the internet. We want to thank uh, Jason Strong, who's in the back orchestra section, and Fairfield Media Center for putting this together with support from our Alumni Association and our Foundation Fund. And from what I understand from one of our inductees, there are 40 Pi Kappa Alpha Brothers in Alexandria, Virginia, sitting around their street. So welcome, Pikes, to Alexandria. Could you take a moment and bow your head, please? Dear Lord, we thank you for the vision of Lewis B. Parsons and founding a college in Fairfield, Iowa in 1875. We thank you for the faculty and staff shared their knowledge and gave vision to the students that raising your own bar a little higher is a good thing. We thank you for this class in 2013 and what they have contributed to their chosen field and to the United States and the world during their careers. Keep all safe as we journey to our respective homes. Amen. Four years ago on this weekend, we conducted the inaugural class and I would like to recognize those folks in your program. We have a listing, so I'm not going to read everybody, but we do have some inductees that are present today. So I have to ask the house lights to come up a little bit, please. And as I call your name as a recent inductee, would you please stand? Dr. William Biff Coomer, class of 1968. You would stand, please. And just Thank you, class of 1957. Dean Gabbard, class of 1946. Thank you, class of 1968. Kay McPherson Ferguson, class of 1959. Class of 1969. Thank you very much. <laughs> this year we have a fifth outstanding class to share with you today. Each year with our winter e-newsletter, we open a nomination period and invite alumni to present their names of Parsons students to be considered for the next October Wall of Honor induction ceremony. Our committee consists of Dr. Robert Tree on stage with me, John Braidwood, who, John, I over the internet, upstate New York, he's got a 50th class reunion that he's helping with in upstate New York. My colleague, John Blackstock, who's right here in the front, front row, and myself. And we consider these names and come to a final consensus. The nominations are announced during the summer e newsletter. The vision for this ceremony is shared with us by John Blackstock, class of 64. John, please stand, because it wasn't for this, we would be doing it. Enjoy the E News. It's thanks to John because uh, his writing talents and gathers, Nancy receives, everybody funnels it to John, and he puts this quarterly issue together, a special one that just showed up the other day. So, John, thank you for the E News and the dedication that we're doing. And this was announced in 2008 when we did the, the Alumni Hall. A uh, recommendation to form a Parsons College Foundation by John Braidwood. I mentioned his name a moment ago in the classroom meeting summer of 2003, so it's, it's been 10 years since some of these visions started percolating. Since the announcement of the foundation, John has worked tirelessly to raise funds to assist in the construction of the Arts and Convention Center and our alumni hall. Total dollars raised from alumni, faculty, and staff during this 10-year time period exceed $212,000. So thanks to you who have made this possible.
You'll find the names of many of the contributors in the brickyard just outside the main entryway to the atrium. Most of you came in these front doors, but there's a brick recognition yard in that area. So thanks to you who have made this possible. Nancy Wartonen, if you'd like to stand, please. We want to recognize you. You'll be on stage after a bit. Nancy. brought the recommendation to form this association to a reunion, and currently we have over 3,000 names of our alumni in the database. Most recently, Dr. Dean Russo's business professor, that some of you may remember, became our 3,000th listing, and this serves the heart of information sharing. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Ed Longenecker. And Ed lives in Mount Pleasant. He came from Gettysburg. I think Nancy lives from Gettysburg too. So thank you, Ed. And Ed puts together and makes sure this emails goes out. So it's not spam, but you can see it. Another name is Doug Merrion, who was with us a year ago. He was not able to be here today. And Ken Rice, if you would stand also, please, Ken. He's our webmaster. He's the most Dr. Robert L. Tree has provided a sounding board for the evolution of the entire process. We will forever be indebted to these individuals who have given so generously of their time and their talent. For without their energy, enthusiasm, and passion, these events, these communications of opportunity would not be possible. Please join me, and I've asked them to stand already and recognize me. One more round of applause for the people that made it here. fortunate in Fairfield and the surrounding areas to have folks that were involved in the faculty and the staff and trustees who are in their attendance at this time. I'd ask for the house lights again, please. I'm going to recognize a few more people. And if you hold your applause on this one until so all of them recognize on this. Uh, Ray Ham, assistant women's basketball coach and admission staff. Uh, myself, physical education. Bob Spencer, head women's basketball coach. Dr. Biff Coomer, he was intramural director. Dr. Robert Tree, history, dean of the college. An inductee today, Vera Price Young, fiscal education. Uh, Bob and Martha Rasmussen are with us today, and they work in uh, publicity communications and counseling and dean for women. Uh, Phyllis Williams is also in the audience today from Des Moines. We're very glad that she is here. So, for all those folks, thank you for being here. A special shout out goes to our sororities. If it wasn't for them showing up, our numbers wouldn't be nearly what they are today. So, especially uh, Betty Downey, Wow Downey, my she's not my sorority sister, she's my sister in law. And she rallied the Alpha Gamma Delta sorority. So, all the Alpha Gams, would you please stand up and show us your, your being Alpha Gamma Delta sorority. Simonson Murphy, Alpha Z Delta, she has a contingency. So all the Alpha Zs, if you would stand up, please.
class of 46 will be recognized here today too. Most recently, we have uh, class of 73. Uh, I think I saw Pat Arns Peck come in. So Pat, if you would stand. Uh, Susie Steinbeck registered. I didn't see her yet today. Susie's here. Thank you very much. Also, we couldn't have this happen if it wasn't for the staff and administration of this fine facility. So, uh, I won't try and do all the names, but Rusty Lippincott leads the team, and Keevan and Eric, and a bunch of other folks make this happen, and we are greatly, greatly thankful. Now, the moment you've been waiting for, travel all the miles from Boston, and from Florida, and from Washington State, California, and all points in between, the fifth annual induction of Parsons College of All of Honor. The formality will be, I will call the presenter to the podium. And after brief remarks about our honoree, we will then call the name of the honoree to come forward. So everybody should use this side as your name is called to come forward. Each will say a few, few words and then present it to the wall of honor plaque, which we will have on the table. Dr. Tree will be with us. We'll move to the center of the stage and a photo will be taken of Dr. Tree the inductee and the presenter, myself, and then the inductee will remain on stage and we will fill these chairs from the center over to the far side with our 10 newest inductees. So once again, all proceed in from this side as your name is called. We also ask so that everyone can hear if you would keep four to six inches and keep it at your upper lip. Otherwise, people won't hear you and especially the folks that are viewing over the internet. So Dr. Tree, are you ready? Let us begin. Our first inductee is Bill Bangham, class of 1970. Would Frank Shalant please come to the podium as a presenter? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce you to a dear friend and a fraternity brother, Mr. Bill Bangham. Bill is a legacy to Parsons. His father had two cousins to attend Parsons in the 1920s. Bill arrived in Fairfield in 1962 and graduated in 1970. Relax. <laughs> he left school two times and was drawn back both times by the faculty of Parsons College. Bill also paid his own way through Parsons College for all those years. The diversity of Alpha Cairo was a great match for everybody. Bill majored in biology, which is very, very similar to photography, and it's all about observation. <laughs> As a photojournalist, Bill has gone through over four passports and has traveled to over 70 countries in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and privilege to introduce you to Mr. Bill Bannon. Ford Von Ohm, who was in his 70s when I came here, and I think I, 
I took every class the man ever taught. And last but not least, uh, Hugh Myers, the chairman of the department, who was incredibly brilliant. Ralph, um, I learned that uh, I didn't want to spend my life in a, in a clinic or a laboratory. Um, I knew it had to do something with something with being outside, out and about among the people. And with, uh, with John King, you know, I learned to smoke a pipe. And, uh, we would sit and, as he said, burn matches together. Um, I got I got to be uh, uh, a student assistant my last year for for John and for uh, for, for Dr. Myers and, and taught labs and. Um, you know, tutored students who were having trouble in biology, and, and, uh, uh, and the thing I remember most in those days was was Hugh Myers agonizing over the students that he taught. He just wasn't just a brilliant researcher, but he just he loved the students that he had. He, he was always looking for he, the discussions we would have when we got together would be how do we motivate this student. And I saw D students become B students, and failing students become passing students uh, underneath Hughes, Hughes Tutelage. Uh, I don't know, you know, it was, it was bizarre you know, in those days, in those conversations. I remember um, going to see uh, Floyd Von Olin one day and, and, uh, and ending up in the library, you know, checking out a book called The Ugly American. What does that have to do with plant morphology? I, I don't know, you know, but that was that was the kind of kind of atmosphere that was here. And, and um, I remember running into a poem by W. H. Auden, and uh, and the last stanza of it. It's, uh, it's it's he titled it September 1939, and uh, the last stanza of it goes: "Defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies." And, and yet, ironically. Ironic, and yet everywhere, ironic points of light flash out wherever the just proclaim their messages. And I, like them, made a pair of sand of dust, would be an affirming flame. And I thought about that was kind of what, what E. Myers was, an affirming flame, you know, amongst, amongst the uncertainties of, of this, these young people who were passing beneath him. And, and um, he, had a, um, he had a saying, students. He would call them his pecker roots. And I didn't know what pecker root was. You know, and, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I, uh, I hesitated to ask him, but, but, but I had to know. You know, just, just what do you mean, what's pecker root? And it's a southern term. And uh, Dr. Myers grew up along the, uh, in the Mississippi Delta, and in the old days, in the old days, the plantation owners would take the wood that was was too crooked to be used for, uh, for construction and too knotty and, and gnarled to be used for furniture. And they would and they would uh, they would stack it along the riverbanks. And the riverboats coming upstream would pick it up and use it to uh, to fuel their journey. And Dr. Meyer said, "You know what peckerwood is?" He said. Um, it's wood that no one else thinks is, has any value. And yet, if you put it in the right place, it will fuel one heck of a journey. And uh, I'd like to think of myself as being one of these experiments. <laughs> um, certainly, uh, certainly not, uh, my life did not turn out as I expected it to be, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I, uh, I admire Dr. Meyer so much that, that I, I even kind of imitated him a little bit. And, uh, and people would go to me and do it. Because you know, he had this, this uh, Mississippi Delta accent that was overlaid with some, uh, some uh, cadences that came out of uh, his time in the Midwest. And, and then he had these bizarre little southern sayings that he'd always say. And, uh, and so I. I don't know if it's so much of a of an Im imitation as it was a as a, a caricature caricature of, of, his, of his accent. And one day I was teaching one of his labs, and uh, and I, I, I lapsed into it because um, I think some of the students you know go to be into it. And, 
and, and I said something like, well, uh, and today uh, we are going to study uh, a, a, a certain uh, uh, aspect of his theology and, and you, will, you will be as happy as a dead pig in the sunshine when you're finished. <laughs> You know, and, and everybody was laughing, all of a sudden, uh, um, everybody was silent. And, uh, and I realized Dr. Myers was standing right behind me. <laughs> and, uh, and I turned around, kind of slow, and I looked, and, and he just kind of looked back at me and, and said, carry on, Mr. Dang. <laughs> carry on. And that's what I tried to do. <laughs> I nominated Dorothy Topping Bell because I know so much about her. I'm not going to tell everything, Dorothy. Don't get worried. <laughs> Dorothy is a resident of Fairfield, where she's lived for 57 years. Dorothy Topping came to Parsons in the fall of 1944 from Van Buren County, Iowa, where she graduated from Stockport High School as the valedictorian for a class. At Parsons, Dorothy majored in English and was a member of the portfolio staff, the Parsons Players, the YWCA, the International Relations Club, the Student Christian Association, the Emperor and Sorority, which later became Delta Zeta. During her years at Parsons, Dorothy met a returning veteran J.Q. Bell, and in the summer of 1948, following her graduation, they were married. They left for Iowa State University, where Jay was already a student in the College of Veterinary Medicine. During the next three years, Dorothy worked, this, worked to support them as her young husband finished school. Upon completion of his doctorate, the Bells moved to South Dakota, where he set up a practice. During their two years in South Dakota, their two daughters were born. When Fairfield veterinarian Dr. Miller was killed suddenly by lightning, the Bells moved to Fairfield to purchase this veterinary practice. Thus began Dr. Bell's very successful practice in Fairfield and the surrounding area. Early on, Dorothy assisted her husband by fielding phone calls at home, recording the client's name, directions to his farm, and symptoms of the animals, all the while caring for their family, which now numbered four children of their two sons. Dorothy has been very active in the First Presbyterian Church of Fairfield. For years, she was co-chairman of the wedding committee, was editor of the church newsletter, served as a Sunday school teacher for 20 years, and is currently serving her second year, three-year term, as a deacon. When one of the women of the church fell, suffering a concussion and losing the ability to speak clearly, Dorothy spent countless hours trying to help the woman regain her speech. She was recognized by the Association of Presbyterian Women with an honorary life membership for her dedication. Dorothy also served many years as Secretary of Gallant Church Circle, a position she still holds. She's a member of the Women's Club, the Witten Wisdom Club, PEO, Tri-T, and several bridge clubs. Dr. Bell's career was brought to an untimely end when he died from cancer in 1982. After Jay's death, Dorothy decided to devote her energies to promoting the arts in Fairfield, the Fairfield schools, and the surrounding community. Thus began the very next, the, the, the next very active period of her life. As a supporter of the arts, Dorothy has been devoted to attending as many exhibits, concerts, recitals, and plays as possible. 
Children in school board meetings as well, speaking up when programs were in danger. Her passion and dedication naturally developed into long and effective memberships on the boards of several art organizations. Dorothy's been a member of the board of the Southeast Iowa Symphony Orchestra, one of Southeast Iowa's premier cultural organizations since 1965. In 1985, she was named an honorary life board member of the Southeast Iowa Symphony Orchestra. Dorothy accepted membership on the Fairfield Concert <coughs> Association Board in 1979, serving as a board member for 33 years, 21 of them as secretary. She diligently managed the logistics of the membership campaign and enjoyed helping to select artists to appear in Fairfield, many of them young musicians just starting their careers. She was a charter member of the Fairfield Art Association, founded in 1966. Dorothy was part of a delegation that she served as, as was the secretary and the newsletter editor. At one time, Dorothy was part of a delegation that went to Des Moines to lobby the governor in favor of the arts. In 1988, she started the Fairfield Garden Tour, which showcases selected gardens for public viewing as a fundraiser for the Fairfield Artists Association. In 2011, the association renamed it the Dorothy Bell Garden Tour. In this, the 25th year of the tour, a special celebration was held. The Fairfield Art Association hosted a Dorothy Bell garden tour. In her garden at 204 Iowa Avenue, friends did her garden a fond farewell and wished Dorothy the best as she moved. Dorothy was known for her lovely tulips. Each year she would oversee the planting of 800 tulip bulbs imported from Holland on the burn of her backyard, among other flowers. It was a show that many people drove by to see. I'm sure they will not be surprised to learn that all four Bell children are involved in the arts. The oldest Sue is a professor of nursing at Minnesota State University in Mankato. Majority, Martha is a majority owner of the architecture firm of Tilton, Kelly, and Bell in Chicago and is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. David is a retired landscape architect, presently living in North Carolina. Scott has been an oboist with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra for 20 years and teaches oboe in Duquesne and Carnegie Mellon Universities in Pittsburgh. Dorothy has worked tirelessly in the schools and communities of Fairfield to promote the arts in any way possible. In 1998, she was given the Outstanding Citizen Community Service Award by the Fairfield Chamber of Commerce. In 1994 and 95, she received the first Outstanding Fine Arts Promoter Award from the Fairfield Arts Association. In 2000, she was given the Marsh Award for enhancing the quality of individual community life in Fairfield. I know you will agree to me, with me, that Dorothy Bell is no ordinary woman. But she's an alumna who we can be very proud, most deserving of this honor.
Vera Young, who has been my friend for a very long time. And this, uh, or Parsons' war on honor, means so much to me. I also want to thank the members of the Parsons College War on Honor for choosing the, the, piece of, the people they did for the class of 2013. This means a very great, and this is a great honor to me, and thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I actually had a whole bunch of prepared remarks, and Dave suggested that as I walked in the building this morning that I speak from the heart. And being here in the heartland, I think that is totally appropriate. Um, I want to thank Dave for uh, giving us the opportunity to come back to Fairfield, me for the first time, and uh, share the wonderful legacy of Parsons College. I know that for David, the unique qualities of Parsons made a huge impact on his life and enriched his life in ways that also reflect back on his successes and reflect back on Parsons. It was here in Fairfield that David met professors who genuinely cared about him and wanted him to succeed. I heard that over and over last night as I met other alumni uh, who echoed that sentiment. They were more than just teachers, they were mentors. They nurtured his talents and became role models for him. It was here at Parsons that he honed his skills in debate as part of a team that may or may not have beaten Cambridge, but certainly held their own in an international debate competition that packed the field house. It was here that he was also able to pursue his love of drama, getting involved with the theater department, and uh, being engaged by the outstanding people who were part of that. Outside of college, he accomplished his goal of learning to fly and earned his pilot's license by training his skills at repairing airplane radios in exchange for flying lessons over in the tunnel. Uh, he managed to do all of this while earning his degree in chemistry and physics and making Dean's List, thereby learning what I think is the most important lesson any college student can learn, how to successfully balance work and life. Each of these skills contributed to the foundation for the successes in his life for which you honor him today. As a native Wisconsinite myself, I also believe that the chance to spend time here in the heartland also served this native New Yorker well by showing him the values that we make Westerners hold so dear. When David graduated, he did return to New York and work at ABC. And if you read his biography, you'll see all of his various accomplishments there. The fact that if you watched and enjoyed any Olympics coverage in 1984 or 1988 from Los Angeles or Calgary, it was because David put together all of the technical requirements for both ABC television's coverage and, in the case of Los Angeles, world coverage by every host broadcaster in every country around the world. For those efforts, he won two Emmy Awards and was also inducted into the very prestigious Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. But it really was all of those qualities that he learned here at Parsons that brought him um, the ability and the, the uh, comfort level to pursue all of the other things that he's done in his life, including balancing that work with his volunteer career in the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary, which now occupies, I figure, roughly 80 hours a week of his time. <laughs> He is the Assistant National Commodore for Response, 
prevention, and international affairs, which means that in the unlikely event that you are ever lost on any of the uh, waterways of the United States and the Coast Guard or the auxiliary comes to help you, Parsons College has a role in that as well. <laughs> Um, his work has taken him around the world and even into outer space as part of his current job as uh, president of Elliott Technologies. He worked with the Discovery Channel on a television uh, uh, project with the International Space Center. So everywhere you look, uh, the effect, the impact of Parsons is part of David's life and now my life as well. I too have some family here in Fairfield, and just before the presentation, my brother by marriage said um, he's lived here for 30 years and is now part of the community. He said it's just because this is such a welcoming community that it really opens its heart and embraces people who come here. And I think that that's what Fairfield did for David. And I know he's honored as am I, by this honor today. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, and thank you all um, for my ability to be here today. Um, you've heard that I, I sort of love things maritime. Uh, so when Dave Neff spoke to me and said, uh, what did Parsons mean to you? I, I sort of thought in nautical symbology. I said, <clears throat> when, I, when I first needed it, Parsons was, was like a, a lifeboat. And it, it came to me, came to, me at, uh, to help me when I, when I needed help, when uh, I needed a, some direction in my life. And then as I stayed here at Parsons and became involved in the life of the college, uh, the professors, people like Dr. Ryland, people especially like Dr. East, uh, provided me with a safe harbor, a place to grow and to learn and to participate in the activities of the college. The other students of the college uh, gave me some joy and some input the ability to, to interact and learn in my life. Uh, so the faculty, the students, the administration, the fact that Parsons itself, the ethos that Parsons had, and I hope continues, at least in our hearts, uh, provided a, a launching point for my growth in my life and hopefully my contributions uh, to my profession and my world and my recollections of all the things that Parsons and all of you meant to me. Thank you. Edwin Everett Green, class of 49, posthumously. His daughter, Joellen Crow, was going to be here, but due to other family commitments, she is not. And so, uh, granddaughter will be providing the presentation today, and Ed's uh, widow, Kay Green, teacher in the Fairfield District for many years, will be the recipient on his behalf. So I would ask you to come forward at this time for the Green family. Amy Trellinger. If you'd had it written, it still might not have been correct. <laughs> I have a hard time pronouncing it some days. So it is my great honor to present on my family's behalf for my grandfather. Um, wow, I didn't think it would be this difficult. My grandfather was an educator. Um, he was born with that gift, and Parsons College helped him to achieve that. He did it in everything that he did. 
Um, my grandfather often said if he could get a child to smile, he knew that he could teach them and that they were eager to learn. Um, he had a wonderful sense of humor and often liked pulling people's legs and telling them jokes in his little time as an elevator ride. So he um, enjoyed people of all ages and of all walks of life. He would motivate us, and I say us, my brother and my cousin and I were lucky enough to get to spend our summers with my grandparents, six weeks each summer. It was always an adventure. We would plant trees and we would pull thistles. He had this great idea on his farm that we could drive the truck around and pull all the thistles and he would pay us a nickel a thistle. <laughs> he got the better end of the deal for certain. Yes ma'am, you wanted to help? Her sister also wanted to help today, but she is away at the Hawkeye football game. I asked her what she wanted to make sure that I told you all about her grandfather, her great-grandpa Ed, and she said, I want you to tell them that he was nice, that he was kind, and that he was funny. So, I'm graciously accepting this award and honoring both of my grandparents, because if it were not for Preston's College, they would not have met, and none of us would be here. <laughs> Uh, it was a long journey. 
Uh, I was uh, under the influence of my hormones at a youthful time. <laughs> and uh, I came to Parsons College, and I stepped off the plane, and I looked at this place, and I went, this is nice. I came from a large urban center in the Northeast uh, that was filled with small steel mills and coal mines. And I knew right away this was going to be a great place. And it turned out to be everything that I expected. <laughs> I think that during my professional career, uh, in fact, I know that I have thought about Parsons College and Fairfield many, many times. I probably uh, may be a little more fortunate than others because I had an opportunity to work here. Uh, my first personal professional experience was here in Fairfield. And uh, I gave a lot of thought to even about what I was going to say here this morning. And if you were in front of High View this morning at 6.15, you saw me practicing that speech and going, what is that guy doing? Uh, trying to get rid of the nerves, you know, a little bit at a time. My wife said, Dave, come on up here and speak from your heart. So, in the next five or six minutes, I'm going to be here from my heart. I can't think of anything in my life other than my family and my wife that had uh, more personal impact on me than the time that I spent in this community. There are a lot of lessons learned, a lot of experiences. Uh, some of the lessons were very tough, some of them were not quite as tough. Uh, and they were all great. If I was uh, going to point my finger at one thing that was so fantastic about Parsons, it was their tremendous desire to enhance student learning. This was not just a concept that they gave lip service to. They provided resources, right in, probably the most magnificent faculty in the country, I think, at that time. Uh, gave us opportunities if we couldn't get the information in a, in a primary lecture, we had opportunities for a tutorial session, and uh, provided just tremendous opportunities. All you had to do was take your hand and grab it. It took me a while to grab it. <laughs> but I did embrace it after a while, and the light did go on. And uh, I would imagine that uh, after this 40 year career that I've had, and the guys that I talked to in my fraternity yesterday that I hadn't seen for 40 years, how did you become an economist? Most of the time we saw you, you were on the end of field or blowing a whistle. Uh, my bachelor's degree here from Parsons is in physical education. But what Parsons gave me uh, was the opportunity to fully understand what learning was about. They gave us, I think, all an opportunity to dream and become better than we were and larger than we were at that time. Uh, you had to go after it, you couldn't quit, and you had to have a dream. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, uh, throughout my entire career, to institute the skills and the lessons that I learned here at Parsons College. As an economist, we, we work on very complicated mathematical and statistical models. Uh, particularly with issues that uh, are as recent as the well spill in the Gulf of Mexico. I learned those things right here at Parsons College. I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with uh, a professor who was a great athlete, particularly for his age at that time. That's not 45 years old. Wow, where'd that time go? And he said, Dave, there's something you have to understand. You're getting there, but you're not there yet. It's important to understand all this information that's in the book. But if you're really truly going to be successful, you have to take all that information and develop concepts and put it together with a purpose in going out in this world and trying to solve some problems and get involved in decision making. That was a lesson that I learned when I left this campus and I've used it my entire life. It has worked successfully in my entire life. I can't think of another place that I would have rather been or friends that I would rather have than the ones right here. I saw a fraternity brother of mine last night for the first time in four years at, uh, from Pi Kappa Alpha. And I asked him, what have you done for four years? And he told me. And he said, you know, Dave, every time I cross that border and I come into Iowa, I get a smile on my face. And I said, I do too. My wife and I came here on Thursday. Uh, we spent time uh, in the community, visiting with friends. And this is, I think, the third or fourth time we've been back since I graduated. It has always been a great experience. Throughout my entire career, people ask me where I graduated from. 
My first response is my Florida State. It's Parsons College. And they say, well, where's that? And I tell them, one of the best places in the world, Fairfield Island. I think if I had one sentence about being here, it's the fact that Parsons College is closed. Uh, their academic model was outstanding. And it was indeed unfortunate that that model could not go forward for other generations. We are in a position in this country where the young people that we have need to go forward, and need to succeed. I'm reminded once again about the, um, the student learning process at Parsons. There was a process here that wanted you to succeed. It was not a process where we wanted to hand out Fs. I, can, I remember the articles that came out in magazines and so on and so forth that chastised us and criticized us for a lot of things. Many people thought that, that was academic and it really truly wasn't. We were an outstanding academic institution. We were then, we are in our hearts today. The graduate students that I teach today in agricultural economics, many of them don't get the concepts the first time. But what I learned here so many years ago that it's okay not to get it the first time. That means I have to work a little harder. And to get them to the point where the light bulb comes on, where we need these people so much, is in itself a journey we're taking. Thanks, everybody.
And I still use that greeting till today. And many times when people see me on the street, they don't say hello, Larry. They say hello, sports fans. <laughs> well, to all who made this day and weekend possible, to all previous honorees and to my fellow honorees, and our many friends who share this day with us, I dedicate my remarks to all of you. And to my late dear friend and classmate, Dr. John DeFazio, who with his wife, Carol, spent many years teaching the Fairfield Public Schools. And my former roommate, Doug Pocock, who had planned on being here today to introduce me, but Doug was not able to make it. And many of you may remember Doug from his days at the portfolio, the year of the legend. He was the official photographer. In fact, he was the official photographer here at Parsons College for many years. Today is about overcoming adversity, getting a second chance, life-altering events and turning points. I have to say this at the outset, the enormity of this honor is beyond measure. It would be a huge understatement to say that I was speechless upon receiving Dave Neff's phone call and I rarely have lost the words. In fact, many times I'm accused of talking too much. That won't be the case today, but I am a storyteller, as Don Hewitt from CBS 60 Minutes always said, so I hope that I relate a couple of stories that will be familiar to you, especially as I'm honored today, I'm going to talk about what brought Nancy and Larry as we look back on Parsons College, and talk about what brought Nancy, Paris, and Larry living together. I have to say this, though, also at the outset, my highest professional honor and personal honor, too, is when one of my students is recognized with a major award, but several have told me as we we're getting ready to return to Iowa, this would be the best, and they said I wouldn't fully realize it until this very moment, and they are correct. As student number 655280 and Nancy 656997, I look around this vast room and I know I'm not alone when I say I have experienced many life-altering events, but without question. These, shall I say, first turning point in my young adult life was when I recognized in pharmacy school that it was not for me. So in the fall of 1964, I visited my high school baseball coach. By then he was my former high school baseball coach, who coincidentally I had dinner with just two weeks ago after not seeing him for many years. Back in 1964, Coach Minnick advised that I look for another school, one that might be more geared to my interests, and one in which I might be able to play baseball. When I got home, I opened a small paperback book. It was written by Herbert Tyre entitled The Conversion of Chaplain Cohen. In addition to being numerous, it contained advice firsthand for the chaplain who wound up at an air base in a small town in Mississippi. Chaplain Cohen's story and Coach Minnick's advice led me to, and this should sound familiar, Lovejoy's College Catalog. And the rest, as they say, is history. I soon accompanied a friend to meet with a Parsons College recruiter. Remember them? <laughs> My friend did not apply, but I did, and I got accepted, received a partial baseball scholarship, thanks to the Philadelphia Phillies, and arrived steamer trunk and tow at the Fairfield train station on February 4th, 1965. It seemed like 25 degrees below zero, maybe 40 below zero, but I do exaggerate. Like many others, I left the trunk at the train station, took that long, cold walk to the campus, and I knew right away it was my new home away from home. Early the next morning, 5 a.m. to be exact, I reported to Coach Joe Luke for baseball practice. I faced a pitch from Dick Mills, who went on a pitch for the Boston Red Sox, so I immediately knew I'd better study hard, because playing baseball would not be my future. <laughs> tell you this, and I don't have it in my notes, but that first pitch, I did not see it. I heard it, but I didn't see it. It might be because the lights were in at the Bright Thomas Fieldhouse. But Coach Lutz's words have stayed with me all these years. Sacrifice, respect, discipline, and desire. Commitment and responsibility. Coach Lutz defined luck as preparation meeting opportunity. Coach Lutz and Parsons did their share. Another turning point, luckily, came soon after I entered my right knee playing baseball. KNCD Radio was broadcasting the game from Legion Field. I knew one of the announcers, Terry Shockley, was leaving. He was going to be heading to Madison, Wisconsin. So I asked his partner, Dave Spillman, if I could fill in. Dave asked, have you ever announced? And I responded, yes. A little white lie. Not saying he was as a public address announcer, rather than play-by-play. -play. Well, thanks to that stretching of the truth and a little bit of luck, 
I have been in radio in one form or another ever since. The most important turning point, life-altering event, occurred on the first day of the summer 1965 trimester. It was in Student Center 1. That's when I sat down in Sydney State's Drama Appreciation class, as you just heard, and next to me was the cutest little blonde I had ever seen. She's still cute, she's still blonde. <laughs> September 1967, just a few months after graduation, we're the proud parents of Julie Beth Kramer, who you just met, her husband Billy, our son Adam Seth, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and his wife Claire. Julie and Billy have ten and a half year old Alana and seven and a half year old Aiden, and Adam and Claire just had, six months ago, Beatrix Grace. Beatrix Grace, that's why we call her Tracy. <laughs> My Roman University students often asked about my teaching style. Why my office was adorned in green and white or Iowa robes. Why I wore green and white during academic ceremonies. And I said I brought some props. This is what I wore. I know you can't see it from back there. But they usually give you the graduate degrees to wear on your regalia. This is green and white. I had to send it back twice to get the right colors and the red that you might see on there is for communication. They also uh, asked a question. They said, uh, why are, I've written a couple of books. They said, why are the books that you've written green and white? I said, well, you'll find out in a moment. And then they asked, what's your favorite college mascot? Well, that would be the Wildcat. And my answer to all those questions is, why are all these? Because it's two words, Parsons College, Parsons College. Among the most fortunate days of my life are my high school baseball coach's advice, my coincidental meeting with that Parsons recruiter, getting into Parsons, injuring my knee, totally embracing the Parsons plan, graduating from Parsons, and meeting and marrying Nancy. If it were not for Miller G. Roberts' vision, Doc Bob, the incredible professors, preceptors, and tutors, I would never have achieved the successes I had. I owe so much to so many, not only from Parsons, but from the people right here in Fairfield. You may find this hard to believe, a day, and I do mean a day, does not go by without my thinking about Parsons. I don't even want to consider where I'd be without Doc Bob and what I observed from Parsons College. It was so much more than academics. My total education included the brilliance of my dedicated professors and other faculty, plus learning a work ethic that my parents already possessed. What it meant to be a committed teacher and coach and social skills which led to many incredible lifelong relationships, we were constantly encouraged to succeed. I promised myself back then, if ever I became a college instructor, and I never, ever, was not even close to being at the top of my mind, if ever I became a college instructor, I would emulate Doctors Bay, Russo's, Robertson, Widener, Dr. Tree, and so many others. And I had this book, Scholars Who Teach, from Parsons College, 1966-67, and how true it is. As a 1999 Roman graduate posted on Facebook just a couple of weeks ago, you, Professor Whitman, promised to pay it forward, and now my husband and I are too. That is the Parsons legacy. In many respects, February 4th, 1965, seems like only yesterday. But I do ask, where have the years gone from a snowy Thursday Flying from Philadelphia, looking out the TWHN window, I had never been away from home. There was my father, my father ready, crying on my mother's shoulder, and she hugged me. <coughs> then I arrived in Chicago, and I took the Axar van, <laughs> a slow milk train, getting into Fairfield, and thanking the good Lord for putting off getting drafted for a couple of years. And I did get drafted right after graduation, and what a commencement ceremony it was. On that day, we were interrupted by a violent thunderstorm that knocked out the power, ironically, during the singing of When You Walk Through a Storm. <laughs> yes, we asked, where have the years gone? The years have brought us here today. Fairfield, Iowa, 52556, just a stone's throw from the campus whose administration, faculty, and staff, staff like Chefs Mike Young and Captain John Bailey from the Old South Room, and cafeteria server Ehrman, they made sure we ate well, and Doc Bob, and Mrs. Louise Roberts, and so many others who taught us to overcome adversity, work hard, 
Get up when you get knocked down. Turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. And like my mother Jeannie always said, Larry boy, if you dream it, you can achieve it. But one more quick true story. Many years ago when I was teaching a graduate course at Rowan, one of my students, a teacher, shared her thoughts at her school about my teaching style and my approach. One of her fellow teachers asked, did your professor attend Parsons College? He sounds so much like the professors who worked with my father. Parsons campus minister, the Reverend Jack Parsons. When the student shared that story with her class, I filled with emotion. Again, the Parsons legacy. So yes, my life has come full circle. And no matter what happens from this day forward, as my mother promised, I have achieved my dreams. And I thank Dot Bob, and I thank Nance, and I thank everyone here, and I especially thank you, Parsons College. Go Wildcats. <laughs>
very accomplished people. I'm just an ordinary person doing an ordinary job, and, um, and it did all start here. Um, Parsons College changed the course of my life. I would like to thank my office and sisters that are here this week, this weekend, supporting me with their enthusiasm. Um, I have not seen some of them for a long, long time, and the decades just absolutely melted away. Um, any one of them, as I listen to their life stories, could be standing here accepting this honor. They've accomplished incredible things, and I was amazed, astounded, and in absolute awe of each one of them. Um, four years is all I was here. Four years. That's about that much of my seven years on the, work, the life here. It was just a tiny slice of my life, but what a huge impact. First of all, I met Patrick here. He changed my life. We were married for 43 years, had two sons, now I have five grandchildren. And Dr. Tree, I, I didn't know you were be here, but we talked about you a lot over the 43 years. <laughs> we both became historians in our own way. I was a social studies teacher. Patrick started out as a teacher and then became a state historian for the state of Michigan. And his absolute joy and soulful passion for history changed some of the spots in Michigan. He helped develop the beautiful, beautiful building in Lansing that's the State Historical Museum. And he has helped, for, or in his lifetime, preserved many sites in Michigan that were going to rag and ruin. And he helped pull them back together, and now many visitors from across the nation enjoy them. So thank you, Dr. Tree. You lit that fire. It also left an impact on my career, but in a little bit of a different way. Um, I think it was David that mentioned that a lot of people should have figured out the Parsons, uh, what was happening at Parsons. But in my world today, we talk about failure is not an option. That's a national agenda in education. Um, we talk about no child left behind, the NCLB, which some people frown about, but listen to what it says, no child left behind. We talk about never, ever, ever lowering the bar, the rigor, relevance, and relationships are what make a difference in our classrooms. And that's really, that was the moral imperative at Parsons. And it influenced me. I left here, and that has kind of been the framework of my life as an educator since I started teaching in 1965. All of these have defined, have defined all of our lives, and they were a part of the Parsons experience. We were way ahead of our time on this campus. And I had no idea because, as Andy said, I was 16. I turned 17 my first um, week here at Parsons. They tell this story that, I mean, I let people kind of believe they think I'm a child, you know, brilliant or something. But really, I went to a one-room schoolhouse and took two grades in one year because there was nobody else in the classes. So, <laughs> I just pushed me on through. But I, I did admit that for a long, long time because it sounds like I was 16 when I went to college. <laughs> But anyway, being a Parsons did change the course of my life. I want to thank again um, the people who are responsible for putting this together, for all of you for being here, and just to say again, I'm just extremely humbled and very, very proud of this award. Thank you. Race to Larche. Race to Larche grew up in Chicago. And he went on to attend the Big Ten School University. He transferred to Parsons College, and it didn't take him long to figure out the difference. Ray was no longer a number in a revolving door classroom, with a professor who was in and out of lectures faster than you could say debit and credit. He got to know his professors at Parsons well, and they got to know him well. If he had a question, they were there. If he needed extra help, they were there. Ray made the dean's list, graduated Parsons with honors, and a major in accounting. Not long after leaving Parsons, he joined the, the premier regional CPA firm in Chicago. They specialized in auditing uh, thrifts. Now, what was a thrift? A thrift in those days is what we now call a savings and loan. 
When this company was purchased by a large international CPA firm, they recognized Ray's talents, put them on the fast track for CPA certification, which gained him membership to the Illinois CPA Society and the American Institute of CPAs. He also found himself responsible for audits of clients with assets exceed $1 billion and playing a key role in the conversion of the first Chicago thrift to a publicly owned company. Ray's interest in thrift savings and loans led him to join Fidelity Federal Savings and Loan as Vice President and Treasurer. He immediately began a transformation of this small one-office finance institution revolving around only a few people to a company position and capable of posting major growth and expanding locations. Ray updated the systems, reorganized the board, installed key committees, added stock incentives, and increased the assets and number of locations. In essence, Ray led the expansion and conversion of Fidelity to the new Fidelity Bank Corp now a publicly held savings bank with stock trading on the NASDAQ. Ray became president, then he was promoted to chief executive officer, and then on to chairman of the board of directors. He was elected director of the Illinois member thrifts and served three terms. He was asked to speak at the Federal Housing Bank meeting in Washington, D.C. 18 years later, he joined the MAF Bank Corp as a director and oversaw the acquisition of his former company. During the process, Ray's duties were expanded to participation in the Illinois League of Financial Institutions, a group of over 500 thrifts. Initially, he served on the board and as a trustee to the trust, but was promoted to chairman of the league, also serving and chairing a number of other committees and becoming vice chair of the trust. Ray retired in 1997 and devoted his time and efforts to the community. He's involved in the Columbus or the Kiwanis Club, the funding of the local PTA special groups, special needs for children, and the fundraising of the Boy Scouts of America. After a well-earned career of impacting and developing, Ray and his wife Bonnie now are retired and split their time between Naples, Florida and Hay Parker, Wisconsin. I'm extremely proud to present my fraternity brother, my friend, Ray Stolarchin. What an honor it is to be here today. I need to start my remarks, so uh, a dear friend of mine, but but my name and nomination, Ernie Costantino. Ernie and I met here at Parsons and became very, very good friends as well as fraternity brothers. Ernie, as it turned out, grew up several miles from my house in Chicago, probably more like two or three, but we hadn't met till we both came to Parsons. Ernie, Excuse me. Ernie succumbed to leukemia. John was, was nice enough to take over as the return. And I thank you for that. Whew. Ernie, I love you. You don't want to be number nine on this. <laughs> technically, but uh, you still don't want to be down on that list. What a distinguished group of people. I'm so happy I made it this year to this presentation, and I'm truly happy to hear that it's being broadcast now, or streamed, whatever the technical <laughs> terms are nowadays, <laughs> out to many more who couldn't make it for various reasons. I'll keep my brief, or my remarks brief, 
because my memory isn't that good. <laughs> but also, as I drove into Fairfield for the first time since 1964, the memories started flooding back. I can recall my dad dropping me off at the dorm. He, he made the long drive from Chicago. In those days, without the interstates, we unloaded the bags from the trunk of my car, or my dad's car, put them on the curb. He shook my hand and said, remember, postage is a lot cheaper than phone calls. <laughs> First of the culture shocks that <laughs> happened on my arrival at Parsons College. As John said, I was used to uh, auditoriums, probably with more than a hundred students listening to a professor. Then going to classrooms and being taught by graduate students, one of whom was had dentures that were causing them problems while <laughs> I spoke. And that was just a calculus course in my engineering quest. Here at Parsons, freshman humanities, can you believe freshman humanities, was the shot across my bow. Dr. John Crosser, who happens to be a PhD from Harvard, Harvard. What did I do? What, what was I doing here? <laughs> Humanities. <laughs> that was just the start. I mean, I could name, as others have, the other tutors, teachers, friends, who were every bit as difficult to on students as anyone from the U of I could have been. But they also had a character, a part of what they did that I still have trouble understanding today, but very much appreciate. I couldn't be here except for them. And I thank them, each and every one, in honor. I'm also honored to be inducted into this society of, of very distinguished people, and honored very much by this Lord who made that election for me. I thank you all. Thank you, John.
communications company, Transnational Sports Communication, advertising marketing firm, was looking for a fast pitch softball pitcher for their softball team. Phil fit the bill. He was a, uh, what they called a ringer in those days. But once hired, Transnational had to find a job for Phil besides slinging a softball. So they placed him in sales and marketing, and his basic job was to entertain clients, take them to lunch, promote the business, and throw a softball. During the course, he also learned a bit about video production, video communications. Not long after, he met a gentleman named Bob Giraldi. He met him on the basketball court, no surprise there. They talked, and soon after, they formed a company called Giraldi Suarez Productions. It became very successful. They received numerous video production awards, and according to People Magazine, they at one time commanded $6,000 an hour for their services. Some of their more notable clients and commercials that they participated in and were, were awarded. Did you ever see the Michael Jackson Beat It commercial from the old days? That's a Giraldi Suarez production. Do you remember the Miller light beer commercials with all the old boys and stuff in this and Whitey Ford and John Madden and whoever else you can think of from those years? Taste great, less filling. Giraldi Suarez production. And they also did work for Paul McCartney, Lionel Richie, who I saw as kind of a semi-regular in one of Phil's restaurants, and Pat Benatar. To top that off, Phil was involved in the production as executive producer of a full-length movie entitled Dinner Rush. He loved to entertain. Fire Island on Long Island was a favorite location of Phil's uh, to entertain, but he became disenchanted with the restaurants on Fire Island. So what do you do when you become disenchanted? You open your own restaurant, which is exactly what he did, and he called it Le Doc. The only previous restaurant experience that Phil had was very, very brief. But yes, believe it or not, it was in Fairfield, Iowa. <laughs> During his senior year, which we've been back in 64, 65, he and a fraternity brother opened a little submarine sandwich shop. It was on 4th Street by the railroad tracks, and you all remember it as an area we used to call Little Chicago. It was wedged in between the popular Den and Why Not bars. <laughs> they called it Phil and Chick's wedge in. <laughs> Perhaps that was the seed from which the interest in restaurants was spawned. As Phil's success and confidence soared, he envisioned opening a restaurant in New York City. Wow, what a big chunk. But as it turns out, New York City is, is Phil Suarez's stage. On a second trip to Positano, Italy, he found a chef he brought him back to the States, taught him English, and opened up a place on Park Avenue South, which he appropriately named Positanos. It was a major success and led Phil to open another, another, and another. Later, he partnered with the famous French chef, Jean Georges, and they together have gone big time. Their marquee locations in New York right now are Jean Jorze, which happens to be in the Trump Tower, JoJo's, which was voted by Esquire magazine as the number one restaurant in New York City some time ago, Gigino's two locations, Mercer Kitchen, Perry Street, ABC Cortina, and on and on and on. Since then, they formed what they call the Suarez Restaurant Group, LLC, and currently own, license, lease, or franchise more than 30 restaurants within the United States and worldwide. Some of the cities and 
locations on that list, which include their restaurants, are, to name a few, London, Shanghai, Paris, St. Barcelos, Cabos, Mexico City, Kauai, San Juan, Qatar, Bora Bora. And you also find Suarez eateries in the Bellagio Hotel, Prime Steakhouse, Spice Market in Atlanta, JT Grill, Bell Harbor, Maine, and Park City, Utah. The market in Boston, JMG Steakhouse in Scottsdale, and Washington, just to name a few. In the latest venture, currently they partner with Starwood Hotel and Resorts worldwide. And Cataron Partners as a basis to create an international multi concept restaurant licensing business. And Phil, who has been a New York Mix season ticket holder for over 40 years, is negotiating with Madison Square Garden in sessions to introduce a new concept called Simply Chicken, where they will supply the food to the executive suites, and on and on and on. And one time when he took me to Yankee Stadium, he's a little sidelight. He takes me to Yankee Stadium, I've never been there. We're walking along, and somebody else kind of come up in the, up in the top. Hey, Swaz, hey, Swaz. Walking along with us. who was that? Oh, that was Whitey Ford. He works for us. <laughs> Whitey Ford, thanks, Paul, if they may still get You'd think that would be enough to earn a couple plaques and do a whole bunch of things, but in the community, Phil has also received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor Award. He's been named to the 100 most influential business leaders in New York City. He's been named to the list of 100 most powerful minority business leaders in New York. He's on the board of the Police Athletic League, the New York Urban Coalition, president of the Catholic Big Brothers Association, and he continues to be a champion for the revival of the Harlem, the Harlem Revival Project. Unfortunately, Phil is traveling. Uh, as I understand, it, he's traveling the Far East, who knows, developing or opening another restaurant. Uh, was unable to attend and accept the award in person. Speaking for Phil and having spoken with him recently, uh, I'm sure that uh, he would want to say that he loves you all, he wishes you all safe travel, and thank you to the PC FF selection. Congratulate his cohorts over here. And he also would want you to know that even though he has moved on in life, that he, he still has never forgotten Parsons College or Fairfield, Iowa, and what it has done for him. So, in accepting the award, uh, Phil was a, was a shaker and a roller and a mover and a shaker on the basketball court. And we uncovered one of his old teammates who has uh, gratuitously uh, agreed to accept Phil's plaque today and say a couple words, and that would be Mr. Ken Rice. Ken, please come. I can only tell a few stories about Phil. I can tell you this, that he always had a smile on his face. And regardless of where you saw him, he was usually singing a song. In the dressing room after practice and after games, it was a good thing that we all were wearing flat tops because he was always in front of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Everything looked great. I'm not sure of the date, but I think it was 19, or excuse me, 2003, in my office one day, I got Ink Magazine. And I'm looking at the cover, and I look at this guy's face. This really looks familiar. So I open it up, and to my surprise, Phil Suarez was in the article just inside the magazine. And all of his accomplishments that John has just disclosed, I can only think of one other real good story. John reminded me of it last night. In a game in Fry Thomas Fieldhouse one night, OB put Phil in the game. Phil very seldom ever got in the game. <laughs> he got the ball, he came down the court, dribbled around, did not pass off, went in and took a shot and scored. And of course, everybody applauded. 
and Phil immediately took it out. <laughs> and immediately, OB pulled him out again. <laughs> I won't tell the stories the night that Phil talked to me on the golf court with him because those don't want to be told. But it is an honor to accept this award for Phil Suarez, who was a great individual even when he was at Parsons. <laughs> Someone once told me to save the best to last. This lady's had a great influence on my life. Physical education teacher, professor at Parsons College, Bureau of Price Young, class of 46. Kay McPherson Ferguson, if you please come to the podium as presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr.
friendship force in Fairfield and open their home to many friends from other countries. The Youngs have raised three very talented daughters. Two are here today. Phyllis, who lives in Washington State, is employed by the United Postal Service, holds an MA degree. Dr. Joni, who is here today, sitting in front, has a Doctor of Veterinarian Medicine degree and an MA degree in Physical Therapy. She lives in Florida. And many of you know Linda because she lives right here close in Kiyosakwa. You've probably seen her directing choruses and choirs and performing in musicals in the area. Through the years, Vera has been a quiet philanthropist, assisting in many projects important to the Fairfield community, including the library, the Fairfield Art and Convention Center, preserving Parsons artifacts, the renovation of the bride's room at the First Presbyterian Church, and now she's really enthusiastic about the renovation of the new high school. Her work has been ongoing, diligent in purpose. She stimulated the minds of young adults. She challenged them to set high standards, and she encouraged them to set career goals. She obtained these strong traditions from her family she, as she encouraged students to think about these lofty thoughts of world hunger and world peace. And these traditions came from her strong family who have lived in Iowa over 130 years. I'm very happy to present Professor Vera Price Young. Thank you, members of the Law of Honor Committee, for selecting me for, and for all your efforts. I know how much work you do before this event takes place. After Dave's introduction and Kay's gracious remarks, I decided you've heard enough about me. And I'm going to tell you about a place on campus that some of you may never have entered. in 1947, I was assigned an office in trustee. 
My husband had also had his office there, but he later moved to Parsons Hall while I remained in trustee for the rest of my years at Parsons. Trustee Jim had a janitor, and his name was Jim. Jim also lived there, and he liked to square dance. And one of his many talents was calling square dances. The fact that he didn't have dances at a trustee on Saturday nights, which were a lot of fun and even good exercise. The sedate Dr. Winifred Watts wanted to learn to square dance, and she, she became a favorite partner of Jim's. Upon the 75th anniversary of the founding of Parsons in 1950, a party was held in the gym, and the festivities included a square dance demonstrated in period costumes. As you can see in the photo, President Shear and his wife joined in, as did the Goldies and my husband and I. I don't know who were the fourth couple. <laughs> Over the years, many Parsons students earned a part of their board and room cleaning trusty gymnasts, <laughs> including my son-in-law, David. <laughs> when Obi Nelson joined the staff as head resident and varsity men's basketball coach, he had an office in the gym also. Between my classes, Obi would come in and out on the floor and challenge me to a game. He would shoot five shots from half court, and I would shoot from the free throw line. Additionally, he had to shoot over the sporting beam in the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> he would usually win, but he was a sharp shooter. Two other amazing events took place in Trusted Gymnasium. One fall, the fast-paced construction common during the Roberts era an academic building failed to be completed, completed when the time classes started. When I arrived on Monday morning to teach my activity classes, an English class of 100 students had been set up on the floor of the trustee. <laughs> the teacher was Dr. Louise Roberts. <laughs> She was a superb teacher, and the rumor was if you dropped your pencil, you missed two pages of notes. <laughs> then in another year, one of the men's dormitories was not finished, and the men without housing had to bunk wall-to-wall -wall in trustee for three weeks. The women in my activity classes could not use the floor, could not access their equipment, and needless to say, we're not able to use the locker room. <laughs> Trustee is no more, but it had a lot of uses. The homecoming dances were held there for many years. Other special dances, such as the Flunders Ball, were held there. The Maple Dance was held at the foot of the hill, which served as the grandstand. Sometimes plays were held there. There was probably not another gymnasium like it in the country, but where they got the plans for it, we didn't know. <laughs> I almost forgot that there was a swimming pool connected on the east side, which was first used by the college and later by the city <clears throat> until the Oakley Nelson pool was finished. But in case this hot summer has blotted ice and snow out of your memory, Trusty Hill was a perfect place for sledding and tobogganing and even an organized snow carnival with plenty of room inside to warm up. Once the field house was built, Trusty was like a fifth cousin. <coughs> it was no longer the center of activity and the men moved their offices and practices to the new building. My department remained in Trusty and I was the last faculty member to occupy the building. We all had places that we remembered with affection. I don't suppose there were more than a few days I was not in trustee during my 25 years of teaching at Parsons. Although I taught classes in Foster Hall and Parsons Hall also. But we do get an affection for old buildings. And that's why I'm going to talk about trustee today.
Um, first thing, before I move forward on this, I want to send out a very special appreciation to someone who gives me great support in my life, and my wife, Sherry Blaunet, and she's in the building. Please recognize her. Thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you. As most of you had a chance to observe when you came into our alumni hall, we have been blessed with the beauty of Bar High Chapel living on forever. The angel stained glass window is presented and first phase was completed a year ago for this celebration. This window was dismantled by Bovard Studios in Fairfield, Iowa and stored for 10 years. The committee of Sally Denny, who is in the audience, Susan Kessel, were co-founders of the Arts and Convention Center. I've had a chance to work with this for a period of time to help provide some fundraising uh, through grants and other things that these ladies have worked. Phase one was completed, as we said, a year ago. Today, we recognize a major donor uh, to phase two, which we just completed during the last 30 days. And those are the top four panels that complete the window all the way to the top. And the Hickenbottom family here at Fairfield has been the primary sponsor on that. So we want to recognize them. There will be a short dedication to follow. Thank you. Phase three of the windows will be the illumination of these windows by Musco Lighting of Oskaloosa. If you've never heard of Musco Lighting, you may have known them for uh, nighttime lighting and football games. Um, a few other places you might recognize, the White House, Washington Monument, Mount Rushmore, and the Golden Gate Bridge. So we feel they have the technology and the availability for us. Our budget for this phase three will be close to $15,000. $9,500 for the actual lights and then the engineering and the other things from there to get the electricity in. I was blessed last evening. Um, we sat down probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock when we sat around the table and John Blackstock says, here today, it's an envelope for you. And a couple of folks in our, our audience here today, they passed a check from a sister supporting this, so we received $1,000 last night. This morning at our board meeting, I mentioned this, someone on the board gets a checkbook out, 250 comes in. Another gentleman who couldn't be with us today, another 250. So we already had $1,500 toward this next phase three. So I, I do thank those, and if anyone else is interested in supporting, please, please connect with me on that. Uh, this afternoon, there are things that we need to let you know about. Uh, Dr. Tree, who is on stage. Mark Schaefer, are you in the audience? Back here. Back here, okay. Mark, you'll have a chance to see the Cardi Historical Museum. Myself, we were approached by Kyle and Terry Henson, Doug and Mary Harrison. I don't know if they're in the building at this time. I'd like to have them stand and be recognized because they're folks that want to help perpetuate this. So if you stand up, thank you very much. Doug, Dad, Bobby Harrison is a city of class of 57, and they have approached us about putting together a documentary film about Parsons. Uh, they attended their, our ceremony this morning, and what I would like to do either during lunch or this afternoon at the Carter Kennedy Museum, if you have special stories that you would like to share and tell that maybe they didn't hear this morning, uh, we'd like to have you speak with them. Uh, the son of Kyle and Terry has a cinema degree from the schools in California, and they would very much like to move forward so more people understand the history of Parsons College. Nancy Workman is in our audience, and she's president of our Parsons College Alumni Association. Since it is the 40th anniversary of the final graduation ceremony, Nancy, I'd like you to take a moment or two to share from the Alumni Association. Before I begin, I'd like to have a raise of hands for those that are here for the very first time since they graduated from Parsons. I'm striving now for 4,000. 
All this time, I'd like to introduce to you the alumni officers. If you're here, please stand when you're hear your name. Debbie Neff, Vice President and Treasurer. Dick, Dixie Hookerman, Secretary. John Hiranda Blackstock, the editor of the e-newsletter. Ed Longnecker, the distributor of the e-news. Frank Schlant, Bill Berger, John Redwood, Richard Ivins, Kate Ferguson, and also Kim Rice, our web coordinator. I also want to thank Lloyd Jerome for providing the name tags. I was here when Parsons closed in 73. That will be a day that I will never forget. They had called an all student body to announce the closing of Parsons. When we came out, the school flag was at half staff. And all kinds of media and all kinds of recruits were there. That will be a day I will never forget. Also, out in the lobby, be sure to check the director the alumni directory to be sure that your information is correct. And make sure to pass the word around about the Parsons Alumni Association and website. We are also on Facebook. Without all of you, this wouldn't be possible. As our little bumper sticker said, we're the little school that refuses to die. Thank you, and have a wonderful weekend.
the word that sometimes you just sort of pass by, but yesterday, unbeknownst to me, I was leaving the facility to go pick up these flowers at the flower shop, and I got a call from the box office saying, Dave, there are two parsons folks who would like to talk to you. So I thought, okay, I will do that. And lo and behold, Marjorie Miller Nordstrom and her husband Fred are in transit from Park City, Minnesota, from their summer residence to Sandbell Island. Marjorie was the choir director at Parsons 1948 to 51, and so I'd like to invite them to the stage to lead us in our alma mater. Please stand. Since choir. 